Welcome back. Okay, I wanna give a couple of examples of hypothesis testing that I think are really intuitive and helped me understand how this works uh, when I was learning. So these examples are from Dr. Q at UNT, um, and I think these are really, really great examples. So the first one uh, I'm gonna do is this Salk vaccine trial for uh, the polio vaccine. So polio was kind of a devastating um, disease. Um, in the like 1950s and around 1954 or 55, this new polio vaccine was developed and tested in a mass clinical trial. Okay, so 400,000 children in this trial. I'm kind of, you know, massaging a tiny, tiny bit to make this a little easier. But, you know, let's assume that there is about 400,000 children in the trial. Uh, 200,000 were given a shot with the actual vaccine and 200,000 were given a shot with a placebo. You had to give them a shot that had a placebo, otherwise they might know that they weren't getting the treatment and that might change their health outcomes. So this was a double blind randomized study. The doctors didn't know who was getting the vaccine or the placebo. The children didn't know who were getting the vaccine or the placebo. And that's really important in these big trials to make it double blind and, and randomized, okay? And out of the vaccine group, so um, the vaccine group is essentially the treatment group. We're going to label this treatment. Uh, 57 of those 200,000 did, in fact, contract polio. They ended up getting polio. And of the placebo group that did not get the treatment, this is the control group, essentially, uh, 142 polio cases were reported. So just by eye, it looks like, you know, there's almost three times as much polio in the control group as the treatment group. So that hints that there probably was some effect of this vaccine. Now, the statistical question that we might want to ask is, was this vaccine effective? That's the public policy version of this question. And I guess the more mathematical way of saying this would be, did the vaccine decrease the rate of polio in the vaccinated uh, treatment group. That would be a more precise mathematical way to say it, okay? So we're going to show, this is a really cool example. There's actually lots of ways of setting up a hypothesis to test this, and that's kind of interesting too. We're gonna set up one way um, that I learned from Dr. Q, Dr. John Quintanilla, and it's a clever way. I like this, this way of doing it, okay? So, um, Let's write down the null hypothesis. That's where we always start. So the null hypothesis is that the vaccine was not effective. So um, let's say null is that the vaccine uh, was not effective. And we should already be thinking in our heads, which of these tests are we gonna be doing? Um, we're gonna do some, we're gonna create some test statistic Z that we wanna be kind of a Gaussian unit normal variable. And probably I'm gonna use a one-sided rejection test because we have a feeling that the vaccine should only help. It probably won't hurt. It probably won't cause more kids to get polio. That's very, that doesn't make sense from how vaccines, how that vaccine works. And so we would mostly be testing, did the rate go down? We're not testing if the rate went up, okay? Now you couldn't switch tests after seeing the results. That would be cheating. You have to decide which test you're doing before you get your results. But it's, I think, pretty reasonable to do a one-sided test on a vaccine that you think probably is only going to make things better and not worse. Okay, null hypothesis is that the vaccine was not effective. This is H not the null hypothesis. And so now what we're going to do is assuming that null hypothesis, we're gonna build a test statistic. So assuming the null hypothesis, then there are a total, there are a total of 199 of 199 polio cases out of the total uh, 400,000 children in the trial. And polio is a particularly nasty disease because it actually has an extremely low uh, symptom rate. You can have polio and only, I think I'm getting the numbers a little wrong, about one in every 200 actually shows symptoms of that disease. So it can be transmitted and spread 
and the observability rate is very low. So it's very hard to detect and it's hard to eradicate. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. Okay, but here the total number of polio cases um, in the trial is 199. And under the null hypothesis, these two populations are the same statistical distribution. They're the same distribution. They're the same as this distribution. So each of these is kind of equally likely to get a share of this 199 polio cases. If you kind of guessed, you would say that about half of them would go to this treatment group and about half of these cases would be in the placebo group. Clearly, that's not what was observed, but that's the null hypothesis that we're testing. And so the way you write this down mathematically is that since it was a randomized test, since these groups were picked at random, uh, and we're assuming this null hypothesis that these two populations are completely equal likelihood of contracting polio, then what we say that uh, the number of children in the treatment group with polio, so the number of children in the treatment group, uh, group with polio, is a random variable x. We're going to call this a random variable. It's like given these assumptions and this null hypothesis and the observation that we had 199 uh, cases, then the number of children in the treatment group with polio is going to be this random variable x. And x is going to be a random distributed, uh, a random distribution. It's going to be binomial with 199 and a probability of one half. Now let's talk through this. Half of the population went into the treatment group and half of the population went into the control group. So it stands to reason that if these are equal groups, then half of the 199 polio cases would go to the treatment group and half of the 199 polio cases would go to the placebo or control group. And that means that out of these kind of 199 coin flips, for each of these polio cases, you flip a coin and they would either go into the treatment group or the control group. I mean, these are human lives. We're not flipping coins, but you know, this is the analogy of a binomial. So 199 of these that are getting kind of randomly sorted into these two equal groups. They're equal under the null hypothesis. Okay. So half of them uh, probably would go into each group. So this is the distribution of X. And so now what we need to calculate is how unlikely, if X is binomial distributed, would it be to actually only get 57 cases? The expected value is 199 divided by 2, just about 100, 99 and a half of the kids. If that's the expected value for a sample this large, how likely would it be to only get 57 polio cases? That's how we test the null hypothesis. So we build a test statistic. Um, essentially, um, so the null hypothesis is essentially that uh, x is binomial 199 one half. That's another way of saying, that's another way of writing our null hypothesis is our null hypothesis would be that the number of uh, polio cases in the treatment group should be binomial with 199 comma one half. And so we set up our test statistic. We set up our test statistic z equals uh, and the way you do this test statistic for binomial, it's basically the same as for, for this large of a N, this binomial converges to a normal distribution. So you could just replace this with normal, uh, with whatever the standard deviation and mean are. That's totally fine. And I encourage you to do that and show that it's the same. But we essentially are going to build our test statistic and say that it's 57 uh, minus 199. Technically, because it's binomial, we do 199 and a half. If you did normal, you would get rid of that half. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to change the answer. Um, divided by the, um, the number of polio cases times a half square root. Okay, so this is uh, 199 over... Ugh, 199, uh, it's root 199 times one half. You can convince yourself that this is the, the sample standard error for 199 polio cases uh, with probability of going into each of these groups of one half. This is essentially the standard error for this distribution. Um, go back and remind yourself what's the variance, what's the sample size, you'll, you'll get this, okay? Um, 
I'm guessing it's like n over 2 and then you divide by root n, something like that, okay? And so this is a number, this is about minus 5.95, okay? About negative 5.95. So usually we write our, our one-sided rejection region kind of in this to the right here. In this case, because I have a negative number, because my 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 mean got decreased. We're actually computing, you know, a left one-sided rejection region. By symmetry, it doesn't matter at all. It's the same idea. Z, my observed amount of polio cases under the null hypothesis, is about six standard errors away from what you would expect. What you would expect is 99 and a half polio cases. That's what you would expect from uh, if these if the null hypothesis is true, if the vaccine was not effective, then you would expect about 99 and a half or you know about half of them in this uh, treatment group. And the observed 57 polio cases is six standard errors away from the expected. Six standard errors, if you look it up in your table, if you look up the cumulative distribution function of 5.95, then the p-value of this, this has a p-value of about 1 times 10 to the minus 9. So there's about a 1 in a billion chance that this was just random and the vaccine was actually not effective. Okay, So this is an extremely strong, 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 significant result that we can reject the null hypothesis. So we reject h naught. And that implies that the vaccine is effective. Okay, very, very cool. This is um, a great way of, you know, kind of checking how to do hypothesis testing. And notice that we didn't use this n or these n's at all. These are not the size of our sample in this uh, test statistic. The size of our sample is the number of polio cases. So this is, a, this is kind of a clever way of turning this on its head is we're, we're saying if the null hypothesis is true, then these 199 polio cases should be equally distributed. That's a binomial distribution with 199 comma one half. So that's a kind of clever way of getting a mathematical statement related to the null hypothesis where we can build a test statistic, okay? Um, I would encourage you, write down, the, write down the normal distribution. This is approximately normal with some mean and some standard deviation. The mean, of course, is going to be 99.5. Standard deviation, there's a formula for that. And then compute this test statistic assuming normal and convince yourself that this actually is the number of standard errors uh, away from expected. Very, very, very strongly significant result. Okay. Now, there's a lot to say about this. There's a lot of, um, lot of ways of solving this. An entirely different way of solving this. My control group is so large that this number of infections, 142 polio cases out of 200,000 placebo um, control group uh, children, that actually is a large enough sample to get a pretty good estimate of the rate of, of uh, polio infections per child. And then what you could do is you could take that and say, what is the chance of getting 57 given that rate? So I could just, I could basically take this as the population statistic and say, what is the chance of this rate given this population statistic? You could form a different hypothesis test. Um, it'll come out to the same thing, essentially, but it'll be a completely different way of doing it. And that would also be interesting and, and uh, kind of useful to do. Now, I mentioned... Um, Polio was eradicated in, uh, in the U.S., um, in Europe, in most of the world in, uh, you know, after this trial. It was, their vaccines were given to every kid, and it was eradicated. There are still cases of polio popping up a few places in the world. Um, as of my most recent knowledge of this, you know, five or ten years ago, Nigeria and Pakistan are the places that have, um, you know, resurgence of polio. And there are concerted efforts, for example, in the Institute um, for Disease Modeling, um, IDM, that's here in Seattle, 
to try to model and control polio, to try to not just eradicate it in, you know, Europe and America, but try to eradicate it everywhere in the world, in Pakistan, Nigeria. And again, because the conversion rate is so low, it's very hard to monitor cases of polio without measuring the whole population. If you do a good job of suppressing it with control by actually vaccinating a, a handful of people, then you know, then your observation rate goes down and it gives the, the disease room to spread while you're not watching. Now, if you can take that population and vaccinate every single person, you can eradicate it. But we're talking about places that either don't have the medical infrastructure to vaccinate the whole population or where there's enough distrust uh, that, you know, the majority of the population won't willingly consent to be monitored and vaccinated. So that actually makes it a really hard modern modeling and control problem where there's, you know, a lot of statistics, a lot of dynamical systems modeling, and a lot of control theory. Really hard modern engineering problem. This is kind of the um, fun hypothesis testing version where it's easy to calculate a super strong least significant result. But today there's, you know, it's, there's still people trying to um, eradicate polio in other parts of the world. Okay, um, cool example of hypothesis testing um, with a large, um, large population being treated. Okay, thank you.